Hi, welcome to our functions chapter. Now, something to keep in mind throughout this chapter is you want to keep your happy function book at the ready. You're going to be using it throughout the chapter, so it's good to jot like little ideas down on the side of things that you want to add to that happy function book because we built it for this chapter. You want to use it as a nice reference. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is a little bit of definitions and particularly restrictions on our domain for our functions. Um, it says prepare for the inequalities mastery quiz, but you know, that's not actually there. Um, so a function uh, is this. This is what we wrote down in our happy function book. My best definition for it is you put one in, you get one out. So if you put something into that function, it should spit one thing out. This smiley face turns into a square. That starburst turns into a square. That's fine. We wouldn't want our smiley face to turn into a square and a triangle. That would be no good. One place you can really see these things is in these piecewise functions. We're going to talk about them more next time, but piecewise functions work by, they can't make up their mind. They start as one thing and then they change to another thing. So you can see in this one, it sort of looks like, a little bit like, that looks kind of like, sorry, I'm stumbling there, a square root function. So it's kind of got like a square rooty type thing. It's been twisted around and turned around. Uh, this one has like a linear piece and still has maybe half of a parabola, uh, but they are still good functions. If we're checking the domain, the domain is everything that could happen in terms of our x values. And as we move across this function from left to right, we see that there are no problems with that domain. So it is all real numbers. So you can write that as all real numbers, the bold R, or you can write negative infinity to infinity. If you're checking the range of a function, you're checking its y values and seeing if there's any problems going on with the y values looking up and down. We can always see our graph somewhere to our left and to our right as we move it up and down the y axis so we know we've got all real numbers. One place that we want to be careful with in terms of our piecewise function is this area right here, which you might be looking at for a little while, like, hey, what's going on there? Well, that's where the function is changing its mind. Notice that the top one has an open circle and the bottom one has a filled in. Nah, it's all backwards. Top one is filled in, bottom is open. If they were both open, that'd be okay. If they're both filled in, so say this open circle was actually filled in, then we would no longer have a function because it would fail our vertical line test at that point. If it fails the vertical line test at a particular point, then it is no longer a function. We can see that same thing happening over here where we've got open, we've got open and closed, open and closed. So we have no problems. This one's going to be another nice all real numbers and all real numbers thing because we can go really far to the left and right with our graph and really far up and down with our graph. However, this bottom one is not a function because those two things are overlapping right there. Look at that, ew, that's no good. I'm failing the vertical line test, so this is not a function. It's actually failing the vertical line test. A lot of times we would need to, I don't know if I can move this. I don't chance it. Uh, yeah, I can't move it. Uh, even if we move that thing so that they weren't quite overlapping, then like we would be okay. But since they're overlapping, it is no longer a function. Now, the second thing I want to talk about today is the restrictions on our domain. Uh, one of them we already know about. We talked about this in the prerequisite chapter that we never want our denominator equal to zero. So that is one restriction on our domain that we know already. Ooh, oops, I need a pen, please. So we want to check what is going to make 5x plus 5 equal to 0. That is going to be one of our domain restrictions. Well, then if you do a little bit of solving, you get negative 3. So that is our restriction on our domain. So we just need to skip over negative 3 on our number line might have recognized this from our interval notation mastery quiz, um, but we just need to skip over that spot. So our domain for this function for f of x is going to be negative infinity to 3 
and negative 3 to infinity. Because we just need to skip over negative 3. Everything else is good. Another restriction on the domain is inside of our square roots. Inside of our square roots, we want to make sure that stays greater than or equal to zero, because otherwise we get imaginary numbers. We're not going to work with imaginary numbers for good functions. Like, yeah, they're kind of functions in their own sense, but for the most part, they're not really functions. Some people are more purists and they don't want to use complex numbers, so we want to make sure we stay greater than or equal to zero. So all you do for these ones when you're trying to identify what that restriction is, is you take whatever is in the square root, don't care about anything else. Five is just five. That's fine. It's not going to cause any problems. But we need to make sure what's inside of the square root stays greater than or equal to zero. So two plus x has got to be greater than or equal to zero. We solve this one. X needs to be greater than or equal to negative two. Um, so then we go to our number line. So at negative 2, we would want to be bigger. So I'm going to go this way. I have equal to, so I am going to put a bracket on this thing. So if I wrote this one in interval notation, it'd be negative 2 to infinity. That's done. Last thing that we need to worry about is logarithms. We need to make sure that if we are working with a logarithm, that anything inside of the logarithm, it not just has to be bigger than zero, it also can't be zero. Think about this as a combination of the two. With denominators, we didn't want zero. The logarithms, oh my gosh, the logarithm square roots, we wanna make sure we're bigger than zero. Uh, logarithms are both. We wanna be bigger than zero and we don't wanna be zero. So we want to take whatever is inside of that logarithm and we want to set it greater than zero. So this x plus eight needs to be greater than zero. Whatever is in the logarithm, set it greater than zero. So that means x has to be greater than negative eight. Whoop, number line, negative eight. So I got to be greater than negative eight. So whoop parentheses, and we head that way. Maleficent decided to help out because this is a tricky one. <laughs> Write that in interval notation, we get negative eight, comma, infinity. And then we're all set. She's gonna bite me here pretty soon, I think. <laughs> I wanna give you one more example here. In this final example, we're gonna put all of those together and we're going to see what happens with all of them at the same time. So we have all three of those domain restrictions. I see one domain restriction right here with x being in the denominator, so that's gonna be bad. Then I've got another domain restriction right here where I've got an x inside of a square root. That's that square root domain restriction. And then I have a final domain restriction right there where x minus eight minus x is inside of a logarithm, so that's gonna cause another domain restriction. So I'm going to deal with each one of these on their own, and then we're going to put them all on a number line to figure out what we got to worry about. So I'm going to start with the denominator. That was the first one that we saw, so that's the first one I'm going to do. So that x squared minus 4, we care about what's going to make that thing equal to 0. We'll solve by square root. So when we, why did I write a 2 here? This should be a 4. After we square root both sides, now we've got a two, and since we square rooted, we get a plus or minus two. So x cannot be plus or minus two. Those are the two things that would cause our denominator to be zero there. So for this whole function, we can't put twos. 
We're not even allowed to put a two over here because that would force us to put a two here. That's bad. Next one we did was square roots. So I'll do that one next. So this three X plus 10, that has to be greater than or equal to zero. It can never, we can't put a negative inside of that square root because we don't want to play with imaginary numbers. So 3x has to be greater than or equal to negative 10. Divide both sides by 3. x has to be greater than or equal to negative 10 thirds. Done. Final restriction, we've got that logarithm. Anything inside of a logarithm has to be greater than zero. Uh, so we just grab what's inside that logarithm and set it greater than zero because we just care what's going on in there. We're not allowed to put a negative number into that logarithm or what would cause a negative number to appear inside of that logarithm. So that's all this equation. I get negative x is greater than negative eight. So x has to be less than eight. Those are all the restrictions that I need to worry about. So let's put them all on a big old number line. Uh, so I'm just gonna mark off some stuff. I'm gonna just mark zero and 10 and negative 10. I've got a bunch of things to put on here, so that'll just kind of help my spacing so I know what's going on. So let's see, we got two and negative two. I said those backwards, but you know what I mean. We're not allowed to be there. So I'm definitely gonna have parentheses on either side of that spot because I need to skip that over. I also need to be less than eight. So here's eight over here. I wanna be less than that and I wanna go in that direction. I also need to be greater than or equal to negative 10 thirds. Negative 10 thirds, that's like three and a third. Yeah, it's like negative three and a third. So that's gonna be back here, negative 10 thirds. So that one's gonna be a bracket and it wants to go this way. Now that red line is gonna shoot all the way across and that green line is gonna shoot all the way across and fill in all of those gaps. So if I combine everything, I know I'm gonna have a nice solid line here, I'm gonna have a nice solid line there, a nice solid line there, but I gotta skip over that negative two and two. So now we can write this whole thing as a huge interval as we read it from left to right negative 10 thirds comma negative two union negative two comma two union two comma eight whoop and that's done that is our domain for f of x this is our domain is what we found as we identified all of our restrictions and after we take all our restrictions together we're able to determine the domain of the function and that's it Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.